false balance is an abomination before the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I quoted you from Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, and we're going to be looking at all 31 verses of Proverbs chapter 11, rightly divided, dispensationally considered, and spiritually understood in the light in which we ought to understand this passage of Scripture, primarily written to Israel for the end days, the last days. So as my title reads, a just weight is wisdom. To continue with the theme of wisdom, we come here to Proverbs 11, and what you'll note instantaneously from the first verse, a false balance and a just weight. So there's scales. We're reminded from Daniel chapter 5, 27. We had spoke about the scales of the Babylonian king. Excuse me. <coughs> he was weighed in the balances and found wanting. The words Aramaic, many, many, tickled and fasten. He was weighed in the balances. So each of us are weighed in the balances. He was found wanting. And if you look at a scale, the way the scale operates is that which is heavy and of value goes down lowly. And that is of no value goes up. Hence you have the, in verse 2, but with the lowly is wisdom. So you have this contrast. William Shakespeare brought out a play called Measure for Measure. He got that from Matthew chapter 7 verse 2. As he judge, so he shall be judged. That's why we judge from the word of God based on the scriptures. Remember Israel was informed to receive the law of the father and the commandments of the father, the law of the mother. In light of that, if they are to judge according to the law and the commandments, then they are effectively having the Lord judge the matter, not themselves in the flesh. So too the body of Christ, we the spiritual one judges all matters. We are spiritually discerning. So a false balance and a just weight, they don't meet in the middle. They're like hanging scales. The greater value goes down, so the lowly go down. Humble thyself in the eyes of the Lord, and He will lift you up in due season. Cast your cares upon Him, and for God careth for you, we're reminded from Peter. So when pride cometh here in verse 2, then cometh shame. Pride, one of the seven deadly sins, Proverbs chapter 6, that we touched on. So the lowly go down, they humble themselves in the eyes of the Lord, but the pride are lifted up on the scale for all the world to see, to show themselves. So we ought to be humble and of lowly spirit. That in the eyes of the Lord is of greater value. Gold is heavy, silver is heavy. Those that receive the wisdom, knowledge and understanding of God are like treasures before the Lord that when weighed have value. But those that are low or full of pride, there cometh shame. So not only do you have a weight to weigh you physically, to see what your physical mass is, and to figure out what your body mass index is, your BMI, to know if you're overweight or underweight or what your percentage is. So not only is there in the physical realm a scale, but so too in the spiritual realm there is a scale. And God weighs the hearts of man. And don't we know from Jeremiah 79 that the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can know it? So a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, as I put you. Those that, during the tribulation period, that take the mark of the beast, they're like a false 
balance before the law. A just weight of those that rely on the Lord and don't take the mark of the beast, but trust God for their daily bread are His delight. He shall be with them. Those that are operating deceitfully. Now we know from 2 Timothy chapter 3.13 it says that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So many spe people speak about revival and things getting better. But in actual fact, the Bible tells us that things are going to get worse and evil men are going to proliferate and multiply. Furthermore, it tells us in Ephesians 4.14, it says, Henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and cast about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness who lie in wait to deceive. Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, he told the little flock, the remnant, his children, be not deceived on four occasions. There is great deception in our time. A false balance. Those that crook the books are a false balance. They're an abomination unto the Lord. You can't crook the books and then come to seek the Lord in prayer. You need to get your house in order if you want to seek the Lord's face in the matters pertaining to where he need, you need him to act with his grace and mercy in those areas. Get your house in order. But a just weight is his delight. Rend down to Caesar what he seizes. A just weight. If you operate in the light, and doing the right thing, which will get onto integrity in a moment, verse 3, then God will be with you. He'll walk with you. Measure for measure. Verse 2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame. So we've touched on that. But with the lowly is wisdom. So wisdom in the eyes of God is, wisdom goes down on the scale so it has great value in God's eyes. Maybe not the eyes of the world. The wilderness, the wisdom of the world is not the wisdom of God. They see things differently because they walk by sight and not by faith. But things of faith and of wisdom and of knowledge and understanding, those instructions which we passed and taught on previous lessons, are of great value in God. It says here, the integrity of the upright shall guide them. The integrity. People always speak about somebody is, is honest and is has integrity and they always assimilate the two together but honesty is being truthful and integrity essentially is doing the right thing when nobody is watching integrity doing the right thing when nobody is watching if you're somebody that needs to be babysat and you're a husband or you're working and somebody needs to babysit you, then you're not a person of integrity. Okay? You do something that's right when nobody's watching because you know fundamentally God is watching. His eyes are roaming over the earth to and fro. He's watching you. And you have a conscience that bears witness. Your conscience is watching you. So if you're not a man of integrity, then how can you go into the prayer room and pray for the God of mercy to send forth grace? Get your house in order. Make it a house of integrity and of honesty. And then go to the Lord with a clear conscience and say, Lord God, send down your grace. Verse 3, but the perverseness of transgressors shall destroy them. The transgressors, those that transgress, those that crook, their perverseness, their presumptuousness, their perversity it shall hinder them it will hamper them and ultimately destroy them the integrity of the upright shall guide them guide 
In Psalm 23, 4, it says, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil for thou rod and thou stop, thou shalt guide me. So God guides us. He guides those that are upright and righteous and seek His face. Job in Job 31, 6 said, Let me be weighed in an even balance that God may know mine integrity. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 19, it spoke about a just balance and just weights and a just ether and a just him shall he have. For I am the Lord that brought you out of Egypt. So it was important to God from the beginning, from the onset of the law, that he said, when you weigh things, it must be just. A just weight, a just balance. And Job speaks about being weighed. Let me be weighed in the balances. That God may know my integrity. Of whom Job, it must be said, God said, he's blameless. But the king of Babylon, he was weighed in the balances and found wanting. If God were to weigh you today in his balances, in his heavenly hanging scales, would you be found wanting? Jesus Christ said, when they asked him about what is the most important commandment, he said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And he further on, he went to say, on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. These two commandments are so weighty. Love the Lord thy God and love thy neighbors yourself. They're so weighty that all the other, the law and the prophets, hang on those. It can hang. They were putting great emphasis on the law and the prophets and neglecting their neighbor. Who is my neighbor? They had to ask Jesus. And then he told them about the Good Samaritan story. Verse 4, riches profit not in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivereth from death. What is the day of wrath? The day of wrath is the tribulation, is the time of Jacob's trouble, is the week of Daniel, the 70th week of Daniel, which is for Daniel and his people, in other words, Israel, the week of Jacob's trouble. Who was Jacob? Israel. The tribulation is for Israel. It's not for the body of Christ. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, because in the day of wrath, the tribulation, they're going to have to take the mark of the beast. And only then that are in that system can buy or sell. Riches profit nothing during that period of time. But righteousness delivereth from death. Verse 5. The righteousness of the perfect shall direct his way. The word way used here for the 21st time. But the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. We've covered this before. Haman hung on his own gallows. Saul got slain with his own sword. They weighed in the balances and found wanting. Haman was found wanting. He hung. He was weighed. A weighing, weighing scale. Judas Iscariot committed suicide. He's weighed. Saul fell on his own sword. Committed suicide. But the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. They'll be weighed in their own wickedness. will weigh them and bring them down. Verse 6, the righteousness of the upright shall deliver them. The righteousness of the upright, the upright, God will lift them up in due season, upright. But the transgressors, those that transgress the law, shall be taken in their own naughtiness, in their own craftiness, in their own guile, in their own vanity, in their own meanness. The Ecclesiastes says meanness, meanness, everything is meanness. Vanity, vanity, everything is vanity. No value. 
but the transgression shall be taken in, the, in their own ordinance. The transgression shall be taken because there's no value on the scale. They don't have anything to put on the scale. In the body of Christ, we have fundamentally the blood of Jesus Christ that goes onto the scale. But those that transgress, particularly during the 70th week of Daniel, the tribulation, they have nothing of interesting spiritual value that they can put on the scale. Because they have been, they themselves are a false balance. They've been cooking the books. And they've been relying on riches to profit them. But that, according to Proverbs 23, 5, will have wings and will fly away as an eagle to heaven. Their riches will fly away from them. Don't put your trust in things that you can touch and have and hold. Those things can be taken from you. Put your trust in the law. Verse 7. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish, and the hope of unjust men perisheth. When a wicked man dieth, his expectation shall perish. Those that die during the tribulation, they have no expectation. There's no hope for them. And the hope of unjust men perishes. It's the irony because they sowed in this world, in this life, and they're not going to reap eternal life because they haven't laid up in themselves treasures in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 57 verse 1 it says, the righteous perish. So here we have in verse 7 it says, when the wicked perish, we know that there is no expectation, there is no hope. But here it says in verse chapter 57 of Isaiah 1, it says, when the righteous perish, and no man layeth it to heart, and merciful men are taken away, none considering that the righteous is taken away from the evil to come. And that's not the rapture, because Isaiah wasn't given the mystery of the rapture. But merciful men are taken away, righteous men are removed. And that's, God is going to be with the righteous during the tribulation. The wicked are going to perish, but the righteous fundamentally are going to be moved from darkness to light. They're going to move from the tribulation into the millennial kingdom, ultimately. The righteous delivered out of trouble, verse 8, and the wicked cometh in his own stead. The righteous, like Noah, is delivered out of trouble. He's delivered out of the flood. The righteous, like just Lot, is delivered out of Sodom. The righteous, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are delivered out of the fiery furnace. The righteous during the tribulation are delivered out of trouble, out of the tribulation, out of the week of Jacob's trouble, trouble, out of the seventh week of Daniel. They delivered out of that. But the wicked comes to his death, the wicked will come to his end. Remember those wicked people that at the end of the tribulation are like the goats, Matthew chapter 25, that are removed and taken to judgment. With two in the bed, one is taken out. With two in the field, one is taken out. The ones that are taken out, the ones that are moved, go to judgment. The ones that remain go into the millennial kingdom. Verse 9. A hypocrite with his own mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. They delivered from being destroyed. The wicked wants to destroy them, but the just with his own mouth shall be delivered. More than in a moment, we get to verse 12. When it goeth well with the righteous, verse 10, the city rejoiceth. Who is the city? The city is Jerusalem. Jerusalem in the book of Proverbs is mentioned 13 times. Unlucky for some. And when the wicked perish, there is shouting. Remember at the days of Jericho, when they went around the city of Jericho, and then on the seventh day, they went around seven times, and it was destroyed, and there was much shouting. Where the wicked perish, there is shouting. When it goeth well with the righteous, the city rejoice. On Mount Zion, on the south of the north, the city of our great King, there will be rejoicing in the city. When Jesus Christ, He came, His first coming, 
on a donkey riding into the city. The second time he's coming on the right horse into Jerusalem to set up his kingdom on earth for Israel, not the body of Christ. We were moved by then in the rapture. Seven years prior, at least. At least. Because of the, we don't know how long the gap is between the rapture and the tribulation. The beginning of the tribulation. Verse 11. By the blessing of the upright, the city exalted. Who's the city? Jerusalem. It exalts itself at the blessing of the upright. But they have a righteous king. King David, the city rejoiced. King Solomon was peace for 40 years. It rejoiced, it exalted. The wicked perished. But he's overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Jerusalem, the city Jerusalem, will be overthrown by the mouth of the Antichrist. Notice the mouth. Like Absalom, he's going to come with great flatterings, according to Daniel chapter 11. And he's going to usurp and overrule and overthrow Jerusalem. More than that later on in this passage. When we touch on surety and the agreement and the peace pact. Verse 12. He that is void of wisdom. We've already touched on void of wisdom. In the previous passage. In Proverbs chapter 10 verse 13. We learned of the man void of wisdom. Why is he void of wisdom? Because he has not got the wisdom. He does not have the Proverbs. The book of Proverbs for the last days. He's devoid of that. Therefore he has void of understanding. Remember, understanding comes from the law. There is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the Almighty cometh forth from God. He that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor. So we touched on destroying his neighbor in verse 9. You have looking at despising his neighbor. And maybe a little bit later I'll tell you some more with regards to destroying and despising and effectively the tail bearer, which comes up in the next verse. But a man of understanding holdeth his peace. A man of understanding holdeth his peace. Because he has the peace of God. Philippians chapter 4 verse 7 says, and it's uh, the peace of God, um, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And verse 9, it actually says there about those things which you have both learned and received and seen in me and heard in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So the God of peace is with, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. He has the God of peace with him. He's going through travail. He's going through tribulation. He's going through the fiery furnace. But God is with him. And if God is with us, as David said, who can be against us? So ultimately, that's what you want. You want the peace of God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding. But a man of understanding holdeth his peace. The peace of God, Philippians 4, 7, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Your hearts and minds will be established in the strength of God. And be established on the rock of Christ and established in the strength. Rooted and built up in Him. Established in the faith. As you have been called, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Colossians 2, 7 reminds us. And here it says, a talebearer revealeth secrets. So you had the man void of understanding, he despises his neighbor. You've got the hypocrite with his mouth that destroyeth his neighbor. Verse 9, verse 13. Here it tells about a talebearer. During the time of Israel's fiery trial, of going through the tribulation, brother will betray brother and neighbor will betray neighbor. But this was forbidden in the book of the law because Leviticus 16, 19 says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. But during the tribulation, there's going to be talebearers that are going to be reporting the remnant to the government of the day. This one world government, which will be at hand and at rule and beck and call of the Antichrist.
the end of verse 13, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. He that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Love covers a multitude of sins. Concealeth the matter. Proverbs 25, 2 says, For it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the honor of kings to search out a matter. Heaven for height, earth for death, and the heart of man is unsearchable. So you have the faithful spirit concealeth the matter. But the talebearer revealeth. He goes forth to destroy and to despise. He despises those that have not taken the mark of the beast. Verse 14. Where no counsel is, the people fall. Remember we've covered already, it says, Wisdom cometh in the multitude of counselors. But here, where there is no counsel, the people fall. They perish. They don't have somebody speaking the truth of God into their lives. So they stumble and fall. They don't know how long the journey is. They grow weary, tiresome. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let my word be admonished, the Lord says. God Himself says, when you seek wisdom on a matter, go seek out two or three people that are perhaps experts in that area. That can give you the knowledge and wisdom that you need in order for you to apply and be diligent and prudent in that area so that you can show discretion verse 15 he that is surety for a stranger shall smart for it and he that hateth surety is sure so we really touched about surety don't stand surety for anybody Ultimately, Israel is going to sign a surety ship with the Antichrist, which we commonly call the Peace Pact. It's the peace treaty that Israel signs with the New World Order for the Antichrist. He that is surety for a stranger, the stranger is the Antichrist. Like the Gibeonites under Joshua's day, they signed a covenant with them. So too Israel is going to sign a covenant with the Antichrist. But he that hateth surety ship is sure. So he that knows the book of Proverbs has the wisdom and the instructions and is diligent and prudent and has discretion and in all those matters pertaining to the book of Proverbs which is wisdom for the last days when he sees, this is Israel I'm speaking about, that his sovereign president or ruler at that time signs showership with the Antichrist, he's going to know that they ought not to sign covenant with any man. Only God, they're the only nation under God that has a covenant with God. It tells us in Romans 9, 4 that the covenants pertain to Israel. Only with Israel. They're not reckoned among the nations. To them were given the oracles of God. Romans 3, 2. We, the Gentiles, are strangers to the covenants. The covenants are not for the body of Christ. We're not under a new covenant. The new covenant will be in the millennial kingdom when the house of Israel and the house of Jacob is under a new covenant with God where they have the law written upon their minds and their hearts. That is the new covenant. The covenant is not for us, not the body of Christ. So when they see, when Israel sees, when the remnant, the little flock, the little children see that their leaders have signed a peace treaty with a global leader, then they will know that to tribulation 
has begun. Because that's what kicks off the 70th week of Israel. Daniel chapter 9. Verse 16. A gracious woman retaineth honor, and strong men retain riches. A gracious woman is likened unto Israel, this gracious woman, fundamentally a virtuous woman, in Proverbs 31. She retaineth honor. Greatly to be praised. And strong men retain riches. God is going to be with the remnant during the time of the tribulation. Verse 17. The merciful man doeth good to his own soul. What you sow, you shall reap. But he that is cruel troubleth his own flesh. He that is cruel troubleth his own household, his own family, his own friends. But the one that is merciful, he does good to his own soul. On the principle of sowing and reaping. Verse 18. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, but to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Again, the principle of sowing and reaping. The wicked worketh a deceitful work. Those that Fight fire with fire. If you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. But to him that soweth righteousness shall be a sure reward. Reward comes to those. God is going to reward those that are righteous during not only the dispensation of grace which we are in now, Ephesians 3, 2, but those that are righteous particularly during the last days, during the seventh week of Daniel. God is going to reward them. Verse 19, as righteousness tendeth to life, so he that pursueth evil pursueth it to his own death. It's like he writes his own death warrant out. As righteousness tendeth to life, it's speaking of eternal life. Righteousness shall produce eternal life. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto thee. Righteousness. God's millennial kingdom which He's going to set up here on earth is a kingdom of righteousness. It tendeth to life, tendeth to eternal life. So he that pursueth evil, pursueth to his own death. Those that pursue evil shall receive what they seek and what they covet. And that is death because the wages of sin, the wages of being evil, the wages of being wicked is death. Verse 20. They that are of a fraud heart are abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. The word way coming up again. 22. They are a fraud heart. Those, going back to verse 1, a false balance, a fraud heart is an abomination to the Lord, but such as are upright in their way are his delight. But a just weight is his delight. A just weight is wisdom. So verse 20 is essentially regurgitating verse 1. Verse 21. Though hand join in hand. Hand. Remember during the tribulation. To buy or sell you need to take the mark of the beast on the hand. Primarily. The hand or the, the head. But let's focus on the hand. Though hand. I focus on the hand because in Matthew chapter. I think it's. Is it 530? Where it says that if your right hand offendeth thee, cut it off. So in other words, if they've taken the mark of the beast, they can still get into the millennial kingdom if they can cut off their hand. However, I don't know how it works if they've taken it on their head. Your guess is as good as mine. Cut your head off, put your head on your arm, and then cross the borderline into the millennial. You figure it out. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished, but the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Even the seed of the righteous shall be delivered. Train up a child in the ways of the Lord, and when they are old, they will not depart. Proverbs 22, 6. The seed. But God's got to says, though hand join in hand. So though the wicked then befriend the righteous, they're not going to go unpunished. 
Though the Gibeonites coveted a signed covenant, I mean to say covenant, not coveted. Though the Gibeonites had a covenant with Israel, they didn't go unpunished. First, so, during the tribulation, there will be those that have taken the mark of the beast that will try and masquerade as the remnant, as a little flock, as a little children. In those seven churches which we touched about, Revelation 2, 3, they'll try and masquerade. They'll, they'll, they'll come and try and join, co-join, be hand in hand. But their hands are wicked. They're evil. But they're trying to justify their sin because they can't buy or sell, save he the mark. Verse 22. As a jewel of gold in a swine's snout, so is a fair woman which is without discretion. So a fair woman here is Israel. But Israel without discretion, now we touched on discretion in chapter 1. We spoke about discretion and wisdom's instructions, etc. So Israel, without the instructions of the Lord, without wisdom, without knowledge, without discretion, they are like a swine's snout. So a swine is likened to a gentile. They are like a gentile. A fair woman, Israel, the Israelites that are without discretion, they are not using the book of Proverbs during the last days, but take the mark of the beast. They are like a swine's snout. And having a jewel of gold in it. You see, as a pig is washed, but it goes wallowing in the mud, as a dog returns to its vomit, so they that hear the word of God, like Matthew 13 speaks about the parables of the sower, they hear the word of God, but because of the cares of this life, and because of the fear, and because of not being part of the mark of the beast system, they go and they take it. It's like they're a jewel of gold. They've got a jewel of gold in the swine snout. They should be a fair woman with a jewel of gold, like Rebecca. When Eli Melech met Rebecca, he put jewelry upon her, like a nose ring, as example. That's what the scripture tells us. But here, this jewel of gold, which is like the discretion of God, the jewel of gold is like wisdom of God, knowledge of God, understanding of God. That's what the jewel of gold, silver, rubies, those are what those things are. That they, they're tangible examples of intangible things, such as wisdom and knowledge and understanding. As a jewel of gold. So they have the oracles of God. Israel has the oracles of God. They've got the word of God. But it's like... It's in a swine snout because they've got no discretion. They're like a fair woman without discretion. I hope I brought that across to you. So Israel that don't follow the book of Proverbs with regards to knowing the, the last days and not signing surety ship with the Antichrist and making covenant with the, the stranger. They are likened as a pig after it's been washed, after it's been baptized, particularly for Israel. Remember, baptism will be instrumental during the tribulation period because they need to keep the commission of Matthew chapter 28 and the 144,000 of Revelation chapter 7 are going to go into all the worlds, baptizing them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, teaching them to obey, obey the commandments. That's not our commission. I've touched on commissions before. The commission of Matthew chapter 20 is not our commission. They call it the great commission in churches today. Neither is a great nor is it our commission. It's not great. They called it great during the days of Hudson Taylor, who was an evangelist to China and to promote it to raise funds for the evangelistic program. They called it the great commission. So it's a, it's a marketing tool. But go look in the passage. Nobody does mention the word great. And if you look in the book of Matthew 28, you'll realize that it's for Israel. It's not for us. Not for the body of Christ. So neither is it those two things. 
Verse 23. The desire of the righteous is only good, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. The expectation of the wicked, the desire of the righteous, is they're going to be spared. They're going to be saved out of. They're going to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego going through the fiery furnace, but coming out on the other side. Yeah, but the expectation of the wicked is wrath. The expectation of the wicked. The wicked are going to go through the tribulation. It doesn't matter now if they are a wicked Jew or a wicked Gentile. They're going to go through the tribulation. Only the body of Christ is going to be raptured before the tribulation. Verse 24. There is he that scattereth and yet increaseth. And there is that withholdeth more than his meat, but is tendeth to poverty. He that scattereth and yet increases, scatters the word of God. The farmer goes out, the sower goes out, he scatters the word. And it increases. And there is that withholdeth more than meat, but it tendeth to poverty. Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5 held back what was due to the Lord. And they were slain in the spirit. They died, they were killed. It tended to poverty. Holding back the riches tended to poverty. Verse 25. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also of himself. That's why Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 1 says, Cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days it shall come back to you. Do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. Verse 26. He that withholdeth corn, the people shall curse him, but he, but blessing shall be upon the head of him that selleth it. The corn is the word of God. He that holds back the word of God during the tribulation period shall be cursed. We are called, we are commissioned to go out and to preach the gospel in season and out of season. So, for fear of the tail bearer, you may find some who want to avoid being destroyed or despised. Not share the word of their testimony. But here, he that withholdeth corn, withholdeth the word of the Lord. The people shall curse him. But blessing shall be upon the head of him that sent it. Blessing shall be upon the head of him that is able to share it and give it to those that are in need. And to tell them about the book of Proverbs. For instance, during the last days of Israel, during the tribulation. What they ought to do, what they not ought to do. And also, the timing of the tribulation. He'll be able to tell them, look, it's seven years. We need to abide. We need to endure to the end. There's a time period. So there's, it's got a beginning and it's got an end. The days are cut short at the end. Verse 27. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor. But he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him. Again, a false balance is an abomination unto the Lord. But a just weight is his delight. He that diligently seeketh good, a just weight, procureth favor of the Lord. We've touched on the favor of the Lord before. But he that seeketh mischief, the abomination of the balances that are false, it shall come unto him. He will again reaping and sowing. Verse 28. He that trusts in his own riches shall fall. Haman, we touched on Haman the book of Esther, he trusted on his own riches, he fell, he fell on his gallows, he hung. Proverbs 23, 5, I quoted it earlier. Proverbs 23, 5 says that riches shall grow wings and fly away to heaven as like an eagle. Don't put your trust in riches. You can lose it. It can be taken from you. Trust in the Lord and not in the countenance of man. But the righteous shall flourish as a branch. As a branch. Jesus Christ is a vine. John 15. The true vine. Israel are the branches. Psalm 1, 3 says, As a tree planted by living waters, who brings forth its leaf in season, whose leaf doesn't wither, he brings forth his fruit in season, whatever he does, he prospers. Like, like this tree, its branches. Verse 29, He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. We've spoken about this man already that troubleth his own house because he's cruel. He's going to inherit 
the wind. Psalm 1, 4 says, The ungodly are like the chafe, they are driven by the wind. And the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. The fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. The wise, who is a delight unto the Lord like a just weight, is the head and not the tail. The fool is like the tail. He's pain catcher. The fool built his house upon the sand. We learned that from Matthew 7, 24. So the fool, the winds come. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind. The wind comes upon the house of the fool, but because he's built his house upon the sand, it's shaken and ultimately it is destroyed. Job's sons and daughters in Job chapter 1, wind came upon the house and destroyed the house. The wind. You need to build your house upon the rock, which is Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, 4. So that though the winds come, the tribulations come, the trials come, the testings come, you will still stand. You won't get puddled over by the wind. Verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. So we've touched on that from Psalm 1, 3. As a tree planted by living water, whose leaf does not wither and fruit does and fruit prospers in season. And he that winneth souls is wise. Going out with the corn and giving it corn to people in need during the tribulation. When you go out, you're casting your bread upon the waters. So those that have and are able to give, they are laying up for themselves treasures in heaven. If you're able to give a physical something like they did in Acts chapter 2, they gave of their belongings. They were doing the kingdom program. And so too if you're able to give of the wisdom of God and the knowledge of God during that period of time. You wise, you win the souls is wise. A just weight is wise before the Lord's eyes. Verse 31. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. The righteous shall be recompensed in the earth. They're going to go into the millennial kingdom. According to the parables of Jesus on the kingdom of heaven parables, the one that has five talents is going to receive ten. The one that has five cities will receive ten. So they're going to be recompensed in the earth. The Lord is going to bless them. He's going to convert those treasures that they laid up in heavens, those eternal riches. He's going to convert them into blessings for those that were wise during the tribulation period, going into them. Much more the wicked and the, and the sinner. The wicked and the sinner is the fool. Psalm 14, 1. Psalm 53, 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. The fool that says there is no God. The wicked and the sinner, they don't believe that there is a God. They build their house upon the sand, and we know what happens from there, Matthew 7, 24. The one that had one talent that buried it was taken from him. And these are the goats in Matthew 25, when the sheep and the goats are separated. The sheep go into the millennial kingdom, and the goats go to judgment. They are like the one that is taken from the bed, or the one that is removed from the field. They are taken to judgment. So in essence, Proverbs 11, 1, a false balance is an abomination in, unto the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Get your house in order. Make sure you are a just weight before the Lord, and that the weight of you, as Job mentioned to us in Job 3, 1, 6, he says, let me be weighed in an even balance. That God may know my integrity. Integrity. Doing what is right when nobody is watching. Do unto the Lord. So be this just weight. That has wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Weighting it down. The, the heavy weight is lowly. Pride goes up. Pride before a fall. Go lowly. And God will lift you up in due season. To God be the glory in Jesus' name.